So we've explored this issue before with trade unions up in arms over uh, labor broking in the country. First of all, what's your position on the matter and the grounds for concern from labor's side when it comes to labor broking in the country? Well, I think the unions have a very strong case. I mean, there's a lot of abuse going on. But the main problem is not so much the attitude of having, the, the idea of having temporary employment services. The problem lies with empowerment. The fact is under Section 198 of the Labor Relations Act, um, the whole question of labor broking or temporary employment services is well covered. And it means that people should, if they're employed by brokers, the brokers become the employers and should give them all the rights and benefits. This is not being enforced, and that's the main problem. Now, the lack of enforcement has just gone on and on. I mean, for example, something like the PSA, one of the largest of the public service organizations, doesn't support necessarily a ban, but they say in the absence of any enforcement, we have to go for a ban, and that's the reality at the moment. So that's what uh, unions are pushing for, but it seems that they are facing now a hurdle in terms of employing strike action in standing up against labor broking practice in the country, needing to get a majority vote from, uh, from the members in favor of strike action, right? Well, they always do get a majority vote in favor of strike action. What they're now trying to introduce is this idea of a secret ballot, and it sounds, you know, it sounds very democratic, but in, in fact it's incredibly difficult and time-consuming to organize. Now that's an important factor, because you see, when workers, for workers, the timing of a strike to have maximum impact is, is most often very important. So the secret ballot device is primarily a mechanism for delaying militant action, for taking the steam out of a dispute. And it actually allows management and, and governments to buy time. So uh, I'm, I'm not very enthusiastic about that at all. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to cause more problems than it's worth. Terry, you talked about uh, enforcement of the law that is there already and that it's not being enforced. Is this comparable to, uh, you know, bad drivers on the road? And uh, the approach of the unions here is to penalise all drivers, uh, whereas the drivers who are obeying the law say, well, why don't you catch the guys who aren't? It's not our fault that they are not behaving. Uh, is it not a, a case of them undermining their, their argument by this sort of shotgun approach? No, I don't think so, because you see the point is that, look, there are one or two um, fairly good employment agencies, that is true, but there are many of them that are actually breaking the law. But in the process, of course, you can't blame businesses, especially in, this tight economic, uh, in these tight economic circumstances, from going for the cheapest possible labor. And this is constantly undermining the casualization of labor by the use of, of these labor brokers is spreading at a very rapid rate and totally undermining the whole idea of organized labor. And that is actually, I think, a very dangerous thing in any democratic society. So I think the unions had to make a stand at this stage. I think uh, Kosatu went too far in calling for an immediate ban, whereas the other unions basically didn't, and that included the PSA. But it got to such a stage where you just were having no enforcement and things were getting worse and worse. Something had to be done. Yeah. Uh, some argue that something has to be done in terms of uh, the kind of action that comes along with strike action when, uh, you know, you know when, strike, uh, when strike action begins, though, uh, Terry. And uh, one of the purposes of this uh, pre-balloting requirement condition that's being implemented is uh, to quell violence that has been associated with strike action in the past. Do you see that as uh, holding any merit going down this road? No, I don't think so. I mean, yes, I, one does not condone any violence, but what often happens is you tend to have, where we've had violent instances, uh, we, a, a, in the first place, we're a very violent country with a violent history, but nonetheless, you'll tend to have it, people who have been pushed to the most incredible limits. I'm not justifying, but I'm saying one has to understand that. That's one of the problems. This is not going to in any way assist. In fact, it will probably exacerbate things because workers are going to get more and more angry and you will have the unions not being able, the union bureaucracies not being able to control wildcat strikes, workers who just become too angry. So I can't see that the secret ballot is going to do anything for it. It's much like this, this business they also talk about bringing in, charging unions, making them civilly liable for damages. That's also worrying because it's, it's sort of like an extension of the doctrine of common purpose, so beloved of the, the previous apartheid regime. It also makes it wide open for um, Argent provocateurs creating trouble. That's one aspect, and the unions are going to complain about that. But also, we come again to the 
whole business of the lack of enforcement. Yeah. The police have already have sufficient powers to prosecute anyone guilty of creating of course, public damage. Of course, Terry, this pre-balloting uh, requirement was a condition that was in the Labour Act a while ago and was then repealed uh, before now being reintroduced. So yes. why was it repealed in the per first place? You've got to ask that question too. Well, I think the unions have never been in favour of the whole idea of, of secret ballots take a long time to organise. You often have an instance, and for ex I think it's very obvious, for example, you call a strike when it's going to have maximum impact. Mm -hmm. The workers don't willingly go on strike. Workers do not wish to. They're the ones who suffer most in the strikes. This is a, a, a reality. So workers don't just down tools and walk out and lose money until they are pushed to that level. So um, a secret ballot is, is absolutely no way out of this. Terry, the, uh, the abuses that you talk about, uh, some of this may be abuses in terms of the law, but looking at the broader picture, you have a, a jobless problem, you have a very high unemployment rate. Are the labour brokers not the clearinghouse uh, for, for jobs? Not and, at all. And if you, if you uh, remove some of them, you make it more difficult for people to find jobs. No, I don't think so at all. I mean, work. <laughs> the point is that businesses, no matter what they are, employ labour because they need that labour. They're not going to employ more labour than they need. They will only employ the labour they can get, that they actually require, and they will try to get it at the cheapest possible rate. And that's the problem with the labour broking issue. So it's not a question. Labour brokers don't, to my mind, create work other than for labour brokers. They don't create the work. The demand for labour exists. It has a set. There's a set amount involved. One can argue and say, well, um, businesses will go more capital intensive. They will in any event. The point is that you have a certain number of jobs required for a certain amount of production, no more, no less. 